Good morning. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome you. If you're visiting with us, we'd like to uh, make sure that you know that we're glad you're here, uh, that we are uh, honored by your presence and encouraged by your visit. We would also like to always extend an invitation that if you're in the area and visiting with us, uh, that you take that opportunity to, to come back and to worship with us. Um, I'll just let you know if you are visiting, I'm not the regular guy. And so um, filling in this morning and I uh, want to spend a few moments uh, in Scripture talking about some thoughts that I have and, and hopefully together as we go through these we'll come away with a, a, a better appreciation of, of some of these thoughts and not just that you guys realize how good the normal guy is. Um, so we'll spend some time this morning um, talking a little bit about um, freedom and, and what we get uh, with Jesus. A couple of uh, weeks ago, my wife and I took a trip to uh, New Hampshire, and, uh, and I'd never been before, and we'd, it's kind of always on our list of, of uh, where we wanted to visit, and, um, and so we're uh, there in the fall to look at the leaves, and, and we did a lot more driving, I think, than I figured, um, because I guess you get there and you think maybe the leaves down the road look different too, and so you drive down that road and you keep on that road. And if you've ever been there, um, they are beautiful. And, uh, and you are uh, surrounded by God's glorious creation. And, uh, and so uh, one of the other things, though, that, um, you know, as we're driving around, every license plate's got it on the back. Um, they've got this state motto of live free or die. And... Um, you know, I'm there to look at the leaves and spend time with my wife, and so I'm looking up a history lesson on where did that come from um, and, and thinking about that things. But we were talking, and, and it, it was a conversation that she and I had about um, just the area around there, and one of the observations we made was it just seemed like to us like um, you didn't see a lot of church buildings. You didn't see a lot of, um, you know, and we come from a place that, that has small towns and multiple churches and and uh, and you didn't we didn't see that now I, I don't want to pass any judgment on the the people of New Hampshire um, because we didn't drive everywhere and we're in some small places and and frankly there are not a lot of people there um, even though they told us you know uh, oh you're from Texas well you bet you can tell here we really like our elbow room and it's like you've got no idea what elbow room is. Um, and so, um, but, uh, but we had a good trip, and, and I was thinking about this, um, this motto, um, trying to, to prepare for uh, this talk. And so, um, if, if you know anything about the story, it revolves around a man named John Stark. Um, and so, the, the motto derives from a letter written by General John Stark on July 31st of 1809. Um, and... Most people in New Hampshire know who John Stark was. He was um, a New, New Hampshire-born war hero. Um, he'd first served uh, as a British officer uh, in the British uh, Royal Army during the French and Indian Wars. Uh, he was a major general of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He was promoted to general uh, right at the end of that uh, before he um, retired at the end of the Re American Revolution. Um, he led troops at the Battle of Bunker Hill there in Boston, uh, which was an important battle, and later at the Battle of Bennington, um, and that's where his victory there earned him the nickname, the Hero of Bennington, um, and that's in, in Vermont. Um, 32 years later, Stark was in failing health. Um, he was invited to a reunion of the veterans of the Battle of Bennington, um, but, he, but he couldn't travel to him, and so he sent a letter in reply, um, and, uh, and I don't have the, the full full part of that letter, but, um, but he did note that he had never forgotten the troops that he commanded in Bennington. He said, quote, they were men that had not learned the art of submission, nor had they been trained to the art of war. But our astonishing success taught the enemies of liberty that undisciplined freemen are superior to veteran slaves. His point there being that he'd taken um, men who weren't trained as soldiers. Uh, he knew the training of the British Army. He knew what he was up against. Um, and yet it was these people who had something to live for and something to die, that they were willing to die for um, that to, uh, to, to defeat um, this military uh, juggernaut that they were taking on. And so 
Um, as an afterword to the letter, he included a brief passage to be read as a toast to the veterans. In that he said, live free or die, death is not the greatest of evils. And it was that uh, live free or die that later on in, in I think in the 1940s, um, when everybody, I guess, was getting a motto and putting something on their license plates, because they had more and more license plates, they had to get one too. And so, um, as with all slogans in America, what do we do? We print it out and stick it on our bumpers, right? So everybody's driving around and says, live free or die. Um, but I do think it's an interesting thing to think about. And I'll admit, my first thought about it was this idea of um, what are we living for? But as I kind of thought about it more and, and more, um, it is that, but, but this idea of, of a choice um, that, they had, that they had to make. Um, how do we think about freedom in this country? And that's kind of a a thing that we talk about a lot. Um, again, with the slogans, um, you know, you think about the, the, the quotes that we have from that time period, um, you know, things that had to do with freedom and death and liberty. And you think of Patrick Henry when he stood in front of uh, the, the uh, Virginia, the second Virginia Congress in, um, in Richmond at this church. He stands up and gives his famous speech. And, and really, a lot of people think that was a, a great impetus for moving people um, to favor going to war, and, and he said, give me liberty or give me death. Even the, the slogan, live free or die, was used in the French Revolution. It's not something he necessarily came up with. Um, and so, and, and it was in French, um, but I'm not going to try that. Um, and so I you know, started thinking about what does freedom mean today. We talk about things like um, freedom of religion. Um, we say things like let freedom reign. And so the songs and the po poems that we recite, um, I think we think about the restrictions of past rulers and governments, um, specifically the tyrants um, that, that brought forth our nation. We talk about our rights, our civil liberties that this country affords its citizens, and, and which is frankly an oddity in the history of world governments. not something, um, what we enjoy here is certainly unique uh, in our approach, and I think, too, sometimes we go too far. Um, some people talk of freedom in some sort of sense where maybe it's a life without restriction. We hear terms like freedom of choice, where the choice they're referring to is the choice to end the life of an unborn child. Um, people are talking about freedom to marry whoever they want. Um, for some people, they take it to mean freedom to do and live as we please. Um, and I guess to a certain extent, we benefit from that idea that, that we get to choose where we go on Sunday morning. We get to choose who we want to associate with and who we don't. And so we are blessed in that sense. But you can see, too, where people get this idea um, that freedom is all about you can't tell me what to do um, and nobody can tell me what to do. Most, un most reasonable people don't think that freedom's completely unrestricted life. Um, you know, we... We all understand that we've got to have laws, um, otherwise we don't have a civilized society. Um, and so all of that, I think, is important, you know, and it's, it's worth discussing. But um, where this is really, um, what I want to spend our time talking about today is really about the message of freedom and liberty that we see in the Bible. Um, it's, a, it's a far superior freedom um, that is enjoyed by the people of God. Um, so let's turn over... Um, and look at our source of freedom. Awesome, my microphone. <clears throat> and um, and then let's um, let's think about that for just a second. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter five. We'll start there. In verse one, Galatians five. Christ has liberate Christ has liberated us to be free. Stand firm then, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. The first thing I want us to think about is the source of our freedom. Um, Jesus is, is that source. He even um, pointed this out um, in his own ministry. Um, jump over, if you will, to, to Luke chapter 4. And if you recall, um, Jesus has been tempted in the desert. Um, he's now begun his, um, his ministry, and, uh, and he goes to Galilee, and he returns... Uh, specifically to Nazareth. And uh, in beginning in verse 16, it says, He came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. Um, He was sending them a message um, when he read that passage, and he was making a claim uh, when he read it, and that was um, that he has sent me, Jesus, um, to proclaim that freedom to the captives and to set free the oppressed. Um, So so Jesus came um, and early on was talking about um, himself being the source of, of freedom. Turn over to, to John chapter 8, the, the reading that we had this morning at the beginning of our service. And this is a, a passage as well that is often read, and, and parts of it are often quoted, um, you know, and, and, and I think too, especially verse 32, is often quoted in the context that, that it's not necessarily talking about here. Um, but um, beginning in verse 30, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they said, we are descendants of Abraham. They answered him and, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be set. You really will be free. And the point that he's making here to them first off is is number one he's the source of that freedom but you know someone who was a slave under that system there were only a few ways they could be not a slave Um, one of which was if their master set them free if um if they were granted freedom and and um you know i think part of the point that he's making there is is that um you know the, the slave has a role in the household but the son has the ability to to set him free um, as somebody who would control the house. Um, and so, um, so that freedom can be granted by somebody who has the authority to do it, and that authority was Jesus. I always get behind on these. So the source of our freedom is, in fact, Jesus. Another thing I want us to think about, too, is the, is the benefits of freedom. Um, and that's what, you know, as Americans, I think a lot of times we like to focus on is what's in it for me. Um, but I think it is worth mentioning that there are um, a lot of benefits of the freedom that Jesus has, has, offered, uh, has offered mankind. Um, first and foremost, there's, there's freedom from sin. Um, turn over to Romans chapter 6. All right, in Romans chapter 6, um, and let's begin, um, let's begin reading in verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin, sin's claims. So Paul's writing here that, that you know, our, our old person, our old man was crucified, was put to death in him, and that's the argument that, that he'll make. And, and the logical part of that, too, is that since somebody has died, um, when they've died, they're free from sin. So, so going through that um, frees us from sin. And so we see that, that one of the benefits is that, it, is that we're freed from that. Um, we're, we see, too, um, if you go over to Romans chapter uh, 8, and just, just a couple pages over, or like me, a couple of scrolls down, um, <clears throat> you get over there and... and Um, we see that there's this freedom from the law of of sin and death. Look at um, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And Paul goes to great lengths to to distinguish between that law of sin and death and versus the law that we're under with Christ, the the law that brought death. Um, We talked about it this morning in our high school class about um, about the differences between, um, you know, what that law meant for man versus what the new law uh, under Christ meant. And so it frees us from that law. Um, in the, the reading that we had earlier in Galatians chapter 5, um, it, it says in there that, that we're freed from the yoke of slavery. Slavery to what? Um, it didn't free 
slaves in the civil sense. Um, in fact, you know, it, it, we, we see in the New Testament passages about how we're to, to behave in those relationships if we're Christians. Um, but it says it, it gives us freedom from this yoke of slavery, and that's that slavery to sin. Um, it removes that from us, that the idea of a yoke being heavy and weighty and controlling. Um, you know, those, those who have been... Um, who have become reborn in Christ, aren't slaves to sin. They don't let sin control them, and they don't let sin control their lives. I think you can also make the case that it, it's freedom from spiritual blindness. Turn over to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's look at... Um, Let's look at verse 16. Actually, um, let's just back up to 12. Um, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness. We are not like Moses, who, who used to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not stare at the end of what was fading away, but their minds were closed. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It's, it is not lifted because it is set aside only in Christ. Even to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Verse 16, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And you know, I think what he's, what he's pointing to them is that there's this idea of this veil being over their hearts. Um, and it's, it's, you know, a veil is something that you can't see past. Um, something that blocks your vision. And he talks about um, even, even when Moses is read, um, even when they would open up and read the law, there was this veil lying over their hearts that their hearts couldn't truly see what it is they were supposed to be seeing. And then he says, but when somebody comes to, to Jesus, um, something else happens. Um, you know, um, and, and frankly, the, the problem that Israel was facing is the problem that every man faces. Um, we all do it at some point where we can't see, truly see what God wants from us until we, it is Jesus who we turn to. And, and when we turn to Jesus, um, that separation goes away, right? That veil is lifted. We're able to see again. Um, Christ you know, has removed this veil so that, that those who turn to him can share in the hope of, of God's promises. We see that, that the freedom in Christ is also freedom from the curse of this earth. Um, some... Versions will also say, some translations will say, the bondage of corruption. Um, turn, turn back over to chapter 8 of, of Romans. And we'll go down to verse 21. Now, actually, it's back up to verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. This, this idea that, that we can be freed from, from the bondage of corruption, um, ultimately, um, you know, it, freedom in Christ is, is what frees us from the decay of, of this world, of this physical creation. Um, you know, it's everlasting life that we look to, um, and that new body, and that new Jerusalem. It's, it's a different... Um, reality uh, beyond what we're all living and experiencing here, um, you know, where where things break down, um, you know, over time mountains erode, and uh, we see it in nature all the time, um, and we see it um, most vividly, I think, in our own bodies. As we get older, um, we see things break down. We see things um, not work as they used to, and and pain and all of that stuff. And what he's saying here, you know, one of the benefits of freedom in Christ is that um, we're looking beyond all of this. We're looking beyond all of this, this that's, that's going to go away um, and looking towards um, something better than, than the decay and corruption of this physical dwelling. <clears throat> also, it, it, Paul mentions uh, in, if you go back to chapter 7 of Romans, it was freedom from an imperfect law. And so, um, beginning in 
yeah, verse, uh, verse 6 of, uh, of Romans chapter 7. But now we've been released from the law, since we, have, since we have died to what held us, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. And I think if we, we turn over to James um, chapter 1, we see there the, the kind of law that we're looking at now. And, and uh, James says in, in chapter 1, verse 25, he says, the ones who look intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not for a forgetful hearer but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. He describes that perfect law of freedom, um, the law that, that gives us all of these benefits um, that we have under Christ. The benefits of our freedom you know, in this country are something we can all and should appreciate. We talk about that a lot, right? We try to remind people. Next Saturday, we're going to observe... Um, and, and the truth is, I say that, but really, nobody's going to observe it. Very few people will, will stop and observe next Saturday, which is um, Veterans Day. And it's, it's, you know, if you know the story about that, it's, it's because of the armistice, armistice of, of World War I. And, um, and that really is a holiday or a day of, of remembrance. It's meant to remember all of the people who made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, you know, we think about Memorial Day, we think about um, those kinds, but Veterans Day, especially if you've known any veterans um, and you've talked to them, it, it has significance to them, um, especially the, the veterans that we, that we talk to today who have, have experienced loss recently, um, that, that people gave um, everything they had in this life for this freedom. And so we try to remind people with things like that, but we do the same thing, right, when we come here. We came together this morning and we gathered around this table to memorialize what was given. We, rem we remember what that, what that price was. And, and, um, and so the freedoms and the benefits that we enjoy, I don't think we have much of a problem you know, thinking about how important they should be to us in this country. But as Christians, I think that, that we have to really be thoughtful and mindful of of how important and how precious those freedoms that, that Jesus has given us are. And, and it, just like Veterans Day and, and, and that memorial, um, it really, I think, comes down to that final thing I want to think about with freedom, and that is um, the cost of freedom. And, and you hear you know, people talk about things like it's not free, and that's the truth. Um, freedom never comes without a price. Um, and, and it... Um, it, it didn't come for free for this country. It still doesn't. It doesn't come uh, for free for people in this world who are oppressed um, by their governments or, or outside forces. And it doesn't come free for the people of God. Um, ultimately, what, um, what it costs is it required a sacrifice life. Turn over to, to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, and, and he's talking about, the writer here is talking about Jesus and, and his humanity at this point. And, and uh, in this book, you know, he does a lot to, to point to um, the sacrifice that Jesus made and, and our benefits. And, and we see, um, see in verse 9, he says, but we, do see, but, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death. Think about that for just a second. Um, that, that he was somebody who left the glory of heaven and tasted death for everyone. Nothing, nobody here wants to die. and It's, it's a natural part of, of being alive. Um, we like being alive. Now that doesn't mean we're not looking forward to what's coming after. Um, but Every one of us thinks about this. Um, we think about if I were to, to not be here tomorrow, you know, the effect it would have on our loved ones. Um, you know, have we done everything that we need to? We think about the eternal implications. Am I the kind of guy that I should have been um, if it were to happen? And so we see the cost that was here because, um, you know, he, by God's grace, tasted death for everyone. Um, and he didn't just, you know, just die. He suffered and he died. 
Um, so it was, it was a horrible death. It was a, uh, a meaningful death um, to all of us. We see this again if you, if you go down to, to chapter 9 um, and see, beginning in, um, towards the end of that chapter, uh, beginning in, in verse uh, 27, And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment, so also the Messiah had been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Um, again, alluding to the fact that it was the Messiah, the one who came to save us all, um, who was offered once um, in death. We see it um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 21. It says, have to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Over there he said, um, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So it, it, was, it was death, it was a horrible death, and it was one in which he took upon um, the sins of the world um, on himself as that, as that sacrificial offering to God for all of mankind. But there's also, I think, another cost um, that, is, that is important for us to consider when we talk about the cost of freedom, and that is it can be a costly discipleship. It should be. Um, it, it, it should cost us something, um, and it should cost us everything. Um, turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Let's go down to verse 32 of Matthew chapter 10. Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. The person who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone finding his life will lose it, and anyone losing his life because of me will find it. Um, the, the point in this passage is that Jesus is telling us that acknowledging him is, is expensive to us. Um, I think there's some encouragement here because he's, telling us that because he understands it. He understands that standing up for Jesus, uh, when you're surrounded by people who, who, who see that as a, an act of aggression towards them, um, isn't easy to do. You know, I know a lot of times I've focused on this about the, the part about um, the, the family relationships and, and what it does to those, um, but I think there's a, a, a broader point here in that um, it's all of the relationships that we have on this earth have to take a back seat to our relationship with Jesus. Um, and that can be hard to do. I think that's a reality. And, and, and it can be hard to uh, stand up that, to that in the moment. You know, you think about Peter, um, who was confronted with this, um, you know, as soon as Jesus was arrested. And, uh, and we, know how, um, we know how Peter went from there. Um, and he got through that, but... In that moment, it was hard for Peter to do, and he didn't do it. Um, in that moment, we have to make a decision. Is that, is that what we're going to do? Um, it can be hard sometimes to say, no, I'm not going to do that because of who I am and who I follow and who I believe. Um, and so you have, to, you have to sometimes stand against the people that you um, work for, work with. You have to sometimes stand against uh, parents. Sometimes you have to stand against your spouse, your kids, um, it, it can cost us a lot, um, especially when you look at the value of, of these relationships that he enumerates here. Um, so the discipleship of, of Jesus can, can, can cost, can, have a, can take a toll on some of these relationships. Um, but, you know, if, if we don't value and protect the relationship that we have with Jesus above all else, um, then, then we're not doing what he's saying here. Turn over to, to Luke chapter 14. 
There's a, a couple of things I want to look at here in, in this uh, chapter. In Luke chapter 14, he says, um, beginning in verse 15, and, and I, actually I'm not going to read this, this first part, but 15 through 24, there's this, this parable that Jesus tells them of this large banquet. And I bring this up because there's, in, the, in this parable, you have this master who sends these invitations to people um, you know, who, who then let the things of this world, the, the concerns of this life, uh, give them an excuse and a reason to not to not come. Um, you know, I, this was this was the the prime invitation. You know, these these were the 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 fancy ones that had their name requesting their presence, and they came up with with some reason not to be there. Um, one guy bought a field and he had to go, uh, you know, take care of it, and some guy had you know new livestock he had to go deal with those. One guy got married, and certainly an important relationship, and. And but, um, but they all made choices to not receive the invitation of the master, um, and so um, his slave comes back to him and reports these things, and and he says, "Go get, go get the people who who are going to appreciate this. Go out and get the people who are poor and maimed and lame, um, and blind. Go get them, and they come." And he says, "There's still room." And so he goes, okay, go get more people. Go out onto the highways, get more people. Go find people who it's going to be important to. Go look for them. Uh, because they came and they, they saw the value in the offering, and they showed up. Um, that, that's one of the, you know, I think an example of, of how you know, we have to give some things up. We can't let things be more important. And then he actually goes into... Um, that a little bit more, and, and beginning of verse 25, now great crowds were traveling with him, so he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be dis my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. He goes on and talks about a king that who doesn't size up the enemy force before he goes into battle. Do I have enough to do this? Um, you know, he's making some points here. He makes the point that we read earlier about the relationships. Um, but, but people make cost-benefit analysis on everything they do. They look at it and see, do I have what it takes to do it? And, and is it worth the cost? Um, and so... Um, I think what we can get from here is that um, is that there is a there is a cost to it. We're not going to take the time to read it, but over in Mark chapter ten, we also see the account of the rich young ruler. And I think in one of the things you know that he comes up to Jesus and tells him, you know, I've kept the law, I've done all these things, um, pats himself on the back a little bit, you know, to Jesus and and says, what what else can I do for you? And Jesus hones in on the one thing that's in the way for this guy. And he says, go sell everything you have. Get rid of all of your stuff. Go get rid of all your possessions. And I think there's a, the way that verse 22 says it, but he was stunned at this demand is what my version says. Um, it wasn't just like, okay, how am I going to do that? That seems like a lot. That it, it really kind of punched him in the face, right? That request, go sell everything. Um, and, and it says he was sad. Why? Why was he sad? Because he couldn't please Jesus? He was really sad because he had a lot of stuff. Um, and I think that's a, a trap for us because we have a lot of stuff. Um, you know, we live in a, in a world that, that all of us, by, by most accounts of the way that this entire world is, enjoy wealth beyond what, what most people will ever see in their lifetime. And we like our stuff. This guy liked his stuff. Um, Freedom comes at a high price, and our freedom costs Jesus his life. Um, and so I think, you know, following Jesus, we have to remember um, it demands a willingness to sacrifice everything in this life for him. A couple quick application points, and then, and then we'll be done. Um, first of all, it matters um, where we put our full faith and trust. You know, you, you see phrases like that on our money or things that are backed by the government, the full faith and trust of the U.S. government um, to back our, our monetary system. And, and, um, and, and when we you know, accept that money, when we use that money, 
we're, we're putting our faith and our trust in an institution that hopefully will su- survive most uh, things of this, of this earth. But um, we have to put our, our faith in Jesus because he's the source of that freedom. Um, that's the only place that we can put our faith and our trust. Um, not, not putting it in the things of this world or uh, not putting it in our own abilities. You know, what, what can I do? Maybe if I'm just good enough. Maybe if I just do enough things right, um, then it'll be a no-brainer when I get in front of the Lord. Um, but he says, no, that's not how it works. Um, that, that we have to put our, our, um, our trust in him. John chapter 14, verse 6, no one comes to the Father except through me, is what Jesus told us. It's the only way that we get there, is that we go through Jesus, um, that we follow him. Uh, the second thing I think that, that we can make application is we must be willing to, to fight for this freedom. And by that, I mean we, we have to be willing to stand our ground. Um, go back to, to Galatians chapter 5 that we read at the beginning. Um, he tells them right there, stand firm. He says, don't return to that way that you were. Don't go back to what that yoke of slavery was. Um, nobody wants who's had a yoke put on them wants it put back on them once it's off. Nobody wants to go back to that. Um, but, but he's telling them right here, you have to stand firm. Um, later on, down in that chapter, he tells them, you know, he makes the point that we're not allowed to serve the flesh. We're not allowed to, to, um, to put our, our needs and our wants and desires of, of the flesh in front of this stuff, um, that it has to be uh, serving Jesus. Uh, in Philippians um, chapter 1, verse 27, he talks about living our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel um, of Christ. And so do we, um, do we conduct ourselves? Do we forsake all other relationships um, for the relationship that we have with Jesus? Um, and then finally, I think that it's important for us to know and remember the consequences of forsaking this freedom. Um, and that's where this choice that's on these license plates and and then this quote comes back. Um, we have that choice to live free or die. It, it really is that for us spiritually. Um, because the consequence of forsaking this freedom is death. Romans chapter 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, and then James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Um, there's only one end for living that way and forsaking that freedom, and that is death. Um, sure, we're all going to die in, in this world, but not all of us are going to die eternally. Um, and so it is because of what Jesus has done. The, um, the Battle of, of Bennington was, by several accounts, very, very, very brutal. Um, it was close quarters. Um, much of it was fought with, with bayonets and the butts of muskets. Um, they, uh, it was a battle between an old empire um, and an infant nation that, that was very difficult, um, hard fought. Um, a lot of accounts say it was between patriots and loyal to, loyalists um, uh, who, had, who had grown up together, who lived in that area. They knew each other. Um, very much like what we think of, I think, more when we think about the Civil War and how fighting that would have, would have been. Um, by all accounts, um, uh, General, General Stark was, a, was a, an honorable, well-respected man. Um, he understood what the Battle of Bennington was and what those guys had gone through and what a lot of them gave up. Um, they lost 70 men at Bennington, which um, compared to what the, Brit- the British lost or were, cap- they were captured, I think, like 200. Um, but, but the British were defeated there. Um, they stood their ground, um, and, and uh, 70 of them lost their lives. Um, but, but they obviously lived with it afterwards as well. Um, the choice to live free or die was clear to them um, who stood against tyranny. Um, the implication was, of course, that dying for the cause of liberty was a sacrifice they were prepared to make. And I think all of us must make a similar choice that has far greater implications um, do we choose the liberty and freedom that a life following Jesus um, affords his people? Um, or, or do we turn away? Do we point ourselves in a direction that, that leads to eternal death? 
um, by neglecting that choice, by uh, turning our backs on Jesus and serving um, our, our wants and our desires. Um, it's, it's a choice that uh, doesn't have a choose A, B, or none of the above. Um, you either choose to follow Jesus or you don't, and you've taken the other option. Um, that's, that's just how it works. Um, so it's a choice that, that everyone here has to make, and, and we want to make sure that everybody is aware this morning that, that we're extending an invitation, the, the invitation that our Lord has extended, um, that this choice is important, um, and that if you haven't made that choice, if, if you haven't uh, availed yourself of the freedom that, that we get by having a relationship with Jesus, by being buried with him in baptism, um, so that through death we're freed from that sin, that we put away that, that old way of, of living, that we remove that yoke of sin, uh, and that we, we live our lives new, to live for Jesus, uh, to serve him, uh, and to, to value that relationship above all other relationships. Um, if, if you haven't done that, you know, we encourage you. If, you've, if, if you have done that and, and you've got um, a need to, to ask for the prayers of this congregation, maybe for sin in your life or things that you're dealing with, um, whatever your need is, is we want you to, to make that known if you'll come up here to the front while we stand and while we